Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Rhonda Seelinger, and I'm the Customer Engagement Manager for iClicker, and I want to thank you so much for joining us today. We really are happy to have you here. We're going to get the presentation, the presentation started momentarily, but I do have a couple quick announcements first. Um, first, and you probably heard this as you were logging in, we do automatically mute everyone, and we do that just to help keep out background noise during the presentation. Um, we do want to hear from you, definitely, so please communicate either using the chat or the questions area. I do monitor both of those throughout the presentation. And at the end, if there's something that you would like to share or have yourself unmuted, you can send me a quick chat, and I am happy to do that as well, because um, we would like to hear everybody's best practices uh, as it pertains to active learning. And I also want to let you know that we are recording the webinar, and we will send a link shortly afterwards. We do archive all of the webinars at iClicker.com, and you are welcome to check that out later as well. Um, and we also have our future upcoming webinars, and um, you can check those out too. And with those things covered, I am very pleased to introduce our guest speaker today, Dr. Edna Ross. Dr. Ross is the uh, course director and also teaches the very large intro to psychology course at the University of Louisville. And interestingly, in the last decade, she has taught over 13,000 students. So we are delighted to have her here to share her experience and best practices. Dr. Ross, I'll let you take it from here. Uh, Rhonda, thank you for having me and welcome everyone. And I hope this will be helpful and I look forward to hearing some of your strategies also at the end. Okay, I'm Edna Ross, as Rhonda pointed out. Uh, I'm at the University of Louisville, Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences. Uh, first, I'd like to talk, give you a little background information on the University of Louisville. Uh, U of L was founded in 1798. It was the first city-owned public university in the United States. We are currently a member of the Kentucky State University System, and we are mandated by the Kentucky General Assembly to be a preeminent metropolitan research university. We have almost 23,000 students, and this was 2016 data. Over 16,000 are undergraduates. Our average ACT is 25.5 and we have over 144,000 alumni in the United States and around the world. The University of Louisville also confers the Grawmeyer Awards, and the Grawmeyer Awards are, um, are, are awarded in five disciplines, which are psychology, music, political science, education, and religion. Uh, the Psychology Award, all the awards this year are $100,000, which makes it the largest monetary award in psychology. Uh, this year's 2018 award winner is Robert Sternberg for his concept and ideas around successful intelligence. And the Grawmeyer Award is um, granted because of creative ideas ideas that impact the field of psychology and help us understand one another and the world around us. Charlie Grawmeyer is a university alum or was a university alumnus and his mission was to endow these awards in order to help change the world. So psychology is very honored uh, to have conferred 18 um, award since 2001, one every year, and our previous recipients include Ann Treisman, Albert Bandura, Elizabeth Loftus, Daniel Kahneman, and Amos Traversky. And uh, so we are, are very proud to um, be able to confer these honors on, on very prominent psychologists. So I have some good news. According to the American Psychological Association, psychology is more popular than ever. 1.6 million undergrads take a psychology course each year. And according to the latest Princeton Review, psychology ranks in the top 10 as the most popular college major for undergraduates. Our introductory psychology course here at the University of Louisville 
actually um, is very, our data is very consistent with uh, national data. We, is a very uh, popular course. We teach two sections of 300 to 350 students each semester. Uh, our course is a gen ed survey course. Uh, the typical student is a first or a second semester freshman. The course is tag team taught, which means we follow each other. Uh, and we have a course director. And the course director basically structures the entire course so there is consistency across instructors and students don't feel that they are in three different courses, but one unified course. Each instructor teaches their specialty area, which we started this almost 20 years ago, and we found that the enthusiasm and the interest that comes from teaching one's uh, own uh, area of interest is sort of contagious. And the students really get interested that way instead of me, and I'm not a clinical psychologist, I'm cognitive. Instead of me trying to teach clinical, I teach cognitive and students uh, benefit from that specialty. You can see the classroom here. And I would be that tiny person up front there. So you can see that this is, you know, holds, this room holds about 350 people. We have a lecture exam every two weeks and we have online homework that's due weekly. Now let's talk about the not so good news. We have a lot of students interested in psychology, but these students come into the course with entrenched misconceptions. For example, we see this, 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 this child here saying, huh, four legs, bigger than a cat, friendly, wet nose, doggy. This is a doggy. This is an example of how, of how uh, a schema, a pre-existing schema filters all new information. Now, often faculty make the mistake, not only in psychology, but in all disciplines, we make the mistake of assuming in order to dislodge or get rid of wrong information, all we have to do is give the correct information. No, not, not true. All new information is automatically filtered through entrenched schemas. As much as we would love to have our students accommodate the information we're giving them, what they're doing is assimilating that information in already existing misconceptions. Prior beliefs, prior learning can and, and, and does hinder new learning. So what do we do about it? How, how do we dislodge these false misconceptions? Now, some illustrations of what I'm talking about, about misguided beliefs that that filter out everything we're trying to tell them about a scientific psychology is a belief in illusory correlations. Now, this is very popular on college campuses and you can see people say, oh, I wore yellow yesterday and we lost. Every time I wear red, we will win. So since their environment and personal experiences support that, and we in psychology, we know we call that superstitious behavior, nonetheless, it's very entrenched because they have the personal experience to support it. We also have the problem of students being very confident in anecdotal information. Now, this is supported by the family and, so, and social environment, and everybody knows uh, that, you know, a um, broken mirror means seven years bad luck. Because my mama told me that and she cut herself and had to get stitches. We also have the problem of unwavering belief in the paranormal. And of course, you know, they get it from the web and it has to be true. So why aren't we talking about these types of paranormal events in class lectures? What do you mean psychology is a science and we don't deal with that? Uh, you must not know how to teach psychology if you're not covering the paranormal. So these are some misguided beliefs that we wanna correct without 
disengaging students without putting a dampening cloth over their enthusiasm for psychology. And so what we do is set the stage for student success and we have a four step process. Step number one are uh, actually deciding what course materials are going to be used. We've used the Hockenberry textbook since the second edition, actually. Students love this textbook. I hear students uh, talk about it, and I've had more than one student come up and tell me, you know, I need the money, but I don't want to sell back the book. I want to keep the book. We also use Launchpad, which provides the um, online homework to give students an opportunity to practice the concepts they're reading about and practice the concepts that I'm talking uh, about in lecture. And in my opinion, the glue are the secret sauce that holds all of this together is the iClicker. The iClicker actually makes active learning possible and it makes it fun. Our second step uh, that we do is to provide an inclusive learning environment. Our department has these signs uh, all around our department, which we want students to feel welcomed and we want students to feel respected. We want each student to feel that they are seen as an individual and what they bring into the table, what they bring into the classroom is important and respected. We also, for step three, encourage the I can do this mental set. Unfortunately, students have the experience in large lecture classes, never our class, in large lecture classes that uh, they're not going to do well. Uh, the exams are going to be next to impossible to pass and that they can look to the right and they can look to the left and half of the people they see won't, won't make it past midterms. Well, we want to disrupt this faulty, what we call, we tell the students, this is a faulty mental set about your abilities. And to prove to you how, we, how uh, confident we are that you're going to do well, we give a free t-shirt for perfect exam performance. That's 100%. So every semester out of about six to 700 students, we give out a total 10 to a dozen t-shirts for perfect exam performance. Now we get a lot of A's. As a matter of fact, since we've been incorporating iClickers and the online homework into our course, we've seen very, very low DWF rates. As a matter of fact, when we just look at earned Fs, we have less than 7% of earned Fs in the last uh, two years. Students really um, internalize the concept that they can be successful in this class. Now let's talk about iClickers. And like I said, iClickers, when used properly, can transform a course. I'd like to call it the secret sauce for learning. What it does is it gives every student a voice, not just the extrovert who is uh, mimicking back what the instructor has said or uh, articulating what they think the instructor wants to hear, but it gives every student a voice, even the student who may not agree with what everyone is saying. iClickers eliminate the just one of the crowd mentality that I think we often get with large lecture classes. Like, you know, it doesn't matter what I do in this class, I can sleep, I can eat, I can daydream. You know, I'm just one of the crowd and they won't miss that I'm not uh, engaged. iClickers also help encourage class attendance because iClickers hold students accountable. Each student registers their iClicker and I know if they're there and I know what answers they're giving me. iClickers help develop a growth mindset. We have uh, approximately 13% minorities. 
um, in our classes. We have first generation college students. Uh, we have what we call Cardinal Covenant students. Cardinal Covenant students are students who get free tuition because their SES situation and their, uh, and their um, income situation is so low that we want to give these students an opportunity for a college education. These students are also in my class. They're intimidated by you know, a class this size for a number of reasons. I want them and we all want them to understand that their ability to do well grows. Their ability to do well can change and increase over time. So iClicker gives them a way of gauging their performance against the other people in their class without them being exposed. So they can say, oh, okay, I'm going to read this. I'm going to do a little better next time. I may have missed this clicker question, but then a lot of people did. And so as the course goes on, they can see that they're getting right answers a lot, that they are up there with the top echelons of students who are doing well. And this really encourages them to, to really understand that they can do college level work and they can do it well. iClickers help connect students with each other and with the course content and engages them. Um, I've been teaching at the University of Louisville for over three decades. We won't go into how many actual years that is because it's almost embarrassing. During those three decades, I have focused primarily on teaching large lecture classes. From the get-go, my goal has been how to get students engaged. How, do, how, how can I get them interested in psychology? How can I get them interested in what's going on in class? In 2005, we beta tested iClickers. And let me tell you, we have never looked back. It has revolutionized how I can interact with my students and how they can interact with me and how they can interact with each other. iClickers help identify and unravel difficulties with problem concepts. Uh, it helps us look inside the black box. Back in the day, before we had brain imaging equipment, psychology would refer to the human mind as a black box. We would know the information coming in. We could see the output, but we would never be able to see what's inside of this black box. Eye clickers help us do that. So instead of you know, bringing in an MIR machine to class and putting each student in, the, how, were, how, how could you think that? What were you thinking? We can use the eye clickers to do that instead with very carefully crafted questions that allow us to see where students are missing the boat, where they're having their problems. Eye clickers also make class fun. It makes class fun without compromising the rigor of the class because each student is held responsible for the quality of their thinking. So now I'm going to talk about some tried and true strategies that I've used in this class over the years. Uh, the strategy number one is have students focus on discriminating characteristics of concepts instead of merely memorizing definitions. Students love to do flashcards. They say, I, I memorized all the, the vocabulary words, and I still didn't do well on the exam. It's because they aren't looking for the discriminating differences between very similar concepts. Uh, those of you who teach psychology can recognize that some of the tricky concepts are differentiating between operant and classical conditioning, negative reinforcement and punishment, schedules of reinforcement, proactive and retroactive interference, and distal and proximal stimuli. 
these are basic fundamental concepts that we cover in introductory psychology. And in order to be successful in future classes, students have to understand these concepts. So how can we make sure that they really understand them, that they can really differentiate between, let's say, operant and classical conditioning, between negative reinforcement and punishment? So I try to get my students to practice thinking through the concepts. I will find a video, and there's a whole bunch on YouTube that are a hoot. Students like um, uh, viewing, they're very short, so you can enter, you know, two minutes in. Uh, this exercise takes about two minutes. And so, for example, I can show a cat flushing a toilet. This cat was just flushing the toilet you know, and looking at the water swirl, and they did, this cat did this every day, all day. Uh, this cat was actually on, the video was on Good Morning America a few years ago, because the owner of this cat had like a $4,000 water bill because this cat was flushing the toilet, and no one knew that the cat was flushing the toilet. Okay, another video is uh, showing a cat doing tricks for treats. So, I can set up a clicker question. Uh, basically, you say, is this classical, is this an example of classical conditioning? Is this an example of operant conditioning? You know, yeah, yeah, yada, yada. But to drill deeper into their understanding, I will select very specific reviews of the video we've just watched. And my clicker question will be whether or not students agree with the selected reviews. The selective reviews will be examples of faulty, faulty thinking, you know, in my opinion, with no supporting evidence type of reviews. And it will help students see where their thinking has gone off track and how the data facts and information presented about these concepts should help them get back on track and might not be um, uh, dissuaded by, by incorrect thinking of other people, which happens a lot. If you want to test whether your students are influenced by other answers that you're getting in the classroom itself, accidentally, and I'm putting, you know, quotation marks around the word accidentally. Accidentally show the histogram of the question you're asking being populated. You know, you can do that by just click, uh, clicking on the histogram before you stop the counter. And students will see the histogram being populated and they will go with the answer most students are choosing. I've used this strategy often, you know, accidentally and misleading students deliberately to choose the wrong answer. I've used this strategy to try to illustrate with them where they have to know the answer themselves. They have to know the data facts and information around the concept and not just depend on someone else knowing more than they do to get the right answer. Okay, another strategy is, that was just a free one. That's not included <laughs> with a number. Another strategy is to use a random number generator so students don't think you're picking on them. This is all random. And you generate 20 numbers. Associate the random numbers with roster names. And then you go into class and you call out, let's say, Anthony Jones because his roster number came up. Now, Anthony is going to be in class. This was an unintended a consequence of doing this that I found out that once I started using the random number generator and calling students' names, they didn't want to be that student whose name was called and they weren't there because it's almost like a price is right type of thing. The spotlight goes around the room looking for Anthony Jones and he's going, here I am. And so Anthony then can choose five people that friends of his or just five people who are sitting next to him to help him answer questions or justify answers to questions. Then we can poll the larger class to see if they agree with Anthony's group. For example, with the cat flushing the toilet, 
Is it classical conditioning or is it operant conditioning or is it modeling? Not only do I want Anthony's group to give me an answer, but I want them to tell me why they chose that particular answer. Now, this is all, this is doing, we're doing all this in a class of 350 students. We're doing this and students are really engaged, they're focused. Oftentimes it gets a little noisy and people will pass the lecture hall and go, well, what are you doing in here? What I'm doing is really getting students hooked on thinking about psychological concepts, which is absolutely amazing. So strategy number three is having students engage in careful listening. Students will, you know, take notes and on an exam, they will miss a question and they'll say, but my notes say, I wrote it down. And so one of the things I want to do early on in the course is to have them engage in um, careful listening. And so I, I read a list of words, and you can see the words here. And I read, uh, read this list, and they can't see the list at all. And I read the list, and then uh, I give them a prompt where they have to write down as many words as they can remember um, without any prompting. So they write down all the words that they can remember, and I'll continue with lecture or do something else. 10 to 15 minutes later, I'll come back and I'll ask them the question, do you remember me saying the word sleep? Well, they got their list right there. If, if sleep is listed on uh, their list, they say yes. And if it's not, they say no. Well, you can see in this one particular class, 76% of the people who responded said, yeah, you said sleep. And you can see sleep is not on this list anywhere. That really gets them going. As a matter of fact, I've had students who say, Dr. Ross, no disrespect, but I think you're trying to lie to us. So now I actually uh, record what I'm saying to them. Not only does this explain uh, the fact that uh, false memories occur, after Elizabeth Loftus work, and that once we get a schema for something, we interject that into our memories, whether it's accurate or not. But it also teaches them to second, uh, to check, to check what they think they heard. And if something seems unusual or different, make sure that they, you know, confirm that they're writing their notes correctly by reading, oh, revolutionary idea, by reading the textbook. Okay, 76% said yes in one class and another class there was 60%. And so you can see that um, the careful listening and also the false memory example um, works very well. Okay, now strategy number four is when I use the numerical function of iClicker. I cannot speak highly enough about iClicker for one. Um, and the numerical function takes my use and anyone's use of iClicker to a whole new level. The questions we ask are no longer just multiple guess questions. We can actually ask very uh, difficult critical thinking questions. For example, um, in this question, I said, what are, uh, if any, are, are, are accurate examples of operant conditioning? Select all appropriate examples. So they really have to go each through each one of these uh, very brief scenarios, and they have to choose each one of these. And then they begin to see how knowing the discriminating differences between operant and classical conditioning help them understand and get the right answer because I don't give partial credit. This is a question that I ask and they have to get them all right in order to get um, any credit for it. 
Okay, I've done um, word clouds or worlds on my course evaluations. And these are three terms that come up almost every semester, quite frequently. Fun, interesting, and engaging. Those are the three terms that I want students to have about my, my particular course. And these are three terms I want students to associate with psychology in general. So thank you very much. That's all I have to say at this point. And I'm looking forward to your questions and hearing some of your strategies. Yeah, feel free, like I said earlier, if you want to type something in the chat area or in the questions section. Um, We'll be happy to hang on here and, and wait and see if we have any. I do have one question, and that is about um, in terms of your grading, like how, how, what percentage or like how many points do you typically get for the iClicker questions versus other methods of homework or, you know, activities? Like is it a big Good part question. of the grade? Is it a Good question. Uh, the iClicker um, points account for 10% of the course grade. And we use iClickers every uh, class period, every, every lecture section. And um, I typically ask four to six questions every lecture uh, period. So uh, this is 10% of their course grade and it can make the difference between you know, an A or a B and students understand that. And I do not, I personally do not give, or none of us, and some people in other departments do, but we don't give participation points. We will ask two types of iClicker questions. One that has a definite right answer, and that encourages students to read ahead of the lecture so they can make sure they get the right answer. And the other one is, you know, a free, we call them free questions, like, you know, uh, did your dog, uh, learn to play frisbee using classical conditioning or operant conditioning. So that's a, because there's kind of a combination there between the two when you're talking about a dog. Or modeling. Did your dog learn to play frisbee by modeling another dog's behavior? Those are free points, for example. Our opinion questions are free points. So we have actual content questions and then we give opinion questions. But I'll tell you that's 10% of their grade. Do you take attendance with it? I know as students are there. And uh, recently, uh, the university, for, if students drop uh, their, uh, the course for, for financial aid, we have to be able to say, was the student there at all? Did the student participate? So uh, I start using iClickers from uh, day one. So I'm not taking attendance per se, but if I'm asked, was a student participating in class, uh, let's say on January the 15th, I can say yes or no to that. Got it, great. All right, I'm not seeing any other questions or comments yet, but I'll, I'll hold on and, and keep it open. And I hope that's okay with you if you could oh, just sure. hold on for that's a few fine. more seconds. And sometimes, and if anybody would like me to unmute them, I'm happy to do that as well. Um, just like I said, send me a chat and uh, I'll, I'll handle that. I know it's awkward with the dead silence. <laughs> I just no, don't want to hang up that. and then we get used I, I to that asking up. questions in class. Yeah. Oh wait, it looks like one's coming in here. Uh, just a comment, really, a very useful presentation. Thanks. Well, thank you guys for um, for spending time. Really appreciate it, and glad you found it useful. Thank you. All right. Well, um, I know people probably need to get to the rest of their day. And I, again, I just want to thank you all so much for your time uh, spending with us today. And uh, Dr. Ross, thank you so, so much for a really great and informative presentation. We really do appreciate it. And um, with that, I just hope everyone goes on and has a great rest of your day. Oh, wait, I see another question. <laughs>
Uh, is the presentation available for download? Yes. Um, we will send a link to the, we are recording this and we will send a link shortly after. And we also have it, um, we'll have it archived on the iClaver.com website as well. Thank you. All right. With that, I'm going to end the webinar. Thanks again, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Oh, oh, wait, wait, wait. Sorry. <laughs> oh, just a uh, great presentation. I'm new to the classroom. Oh, thank you for, for sharing that. We appreciate it. I agree. It was a great presentation. All right. It looks like people are hopping off. Thanks again. Bye-bye, everybody.